Well, hey, I hope you have your Bibles. If so, open up to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, we just got to this week and one more um, in this series uh, that we are calling Dear Church. We're in week six of a seven-week series where we have been looking at the seven letters written to seven churches uh, in the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3. Um, we're doing that because I was blessed to get to go there um, this last summer and to see these incredible places, and uh, we learned a lot, and, uh, and I, I filled, filled my notebook full of incredible, incredible things, um, but just to be there and see these places was just uh, phenomenal, and what a gift it was. And uh, These are letters, letters from Jesus himself to his bride, the church, and they are letters of loving encouragement. And then sometimes they're letters of loving correction. And this week, we're going to continue on this journey and come to the smallest of the seven churches. The, the church, um, but it might be the smallest, but it's the one that has a name that's probably most recognizable to you. It's the church at Philadelphia. Okay, church at Philadelphia. Now, um, if, if you think of the, the word, the name of the city, Philadelphia, uh, what, what do you think of? Yeah, yeah, maybe a Philly cheesesteak, right? So, yeah, that, that's later this afternoon, right? Um, and uh, may, maybe it's the Philadelphia Eagles, right? Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe it's Independence Hall, right, or Liberty Bell, some of these great places. When I think of Philadelphia, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is this picture right here, Rocky Balboa. <laughs> Right? Um, he is on the top of the steps up there by the museum, by the city hall there, and he ran, and, um, and Rocky's just kind of part of Philadelphia, and uh, he's this, you know, he runs up these iconic steps here, and, um, and then that really starts off what seems like the never-ending series of Rocky movies, <laughs> right? Because you got Rocky 1, where Rocky goes the distance, but he still loses, right, in the split decision with, with Apollo Creed. Then in Rocky II, he comes back for the rematch, and he becomes the champion. And then in Rocky III, he fights um, and loses to Mr. T, right? Remember that? And then his, his trainer, Mickey, dies, and that's a horrible thing. But then he comes back, and he beats Mr. T. And then in Rocky IV, he fight, fights the Russian guy, Ivan Drago, who kills his friend Apollo. But then Rocky comes back and beats him. Then in Rocky V, he retires. But then he trains this guy, Tommy Gunn. And at the end of the movie, there's this crazy street fight because the guy he was training kind of goes against him. Then in Rocky VI, right? I mean, it just goes on and on. But in Rocky 6, we finally get to this place, and he's talking to his son. And this is, this is, out of all of the Rocky movies, you know, other than Yo, Adrian, right? <laughs> One of my favorite lines in all of the Rocky movies comes in, uh, in Rocky 6. And Rocky is standing in the middle of the street, and he's talking to his son. Who, uh, and his son's upset with him and everything else. And he looks at his son, and he says these words. He says, it's not how hard you can, you can hit it's how hard you can get hit and still get up and move forward, right? I mean, and at the core, that's what these movies, these Rocky movies are truly all about, right? They're all about perseverance, about getting hit and getting back up. They're about standing strong in the face of adversity, and it's about getting up when others would have given up. That's what the Rocky movies are all about. And, and not only is this the theme of the Rocky movies, this is the, this is the theme of the character of the church at Philadelphia. And I think some things that we can learn uh, from them today are this idea of perseverance. And so we're going to start out in, in verse 7 where it says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. Now, the city of Philadelphia is 40 miles south of Sardis, the city that we were in last week. It was established in, in 189 B.C. by King um, Umenes II, and he handed his, the kingdom over to his brother, Atellus II, who he loved so much, and, the, and these two brothers, these two ruling brothers loved each other so much that when he handed this city over to his younger brother whom he loved, they named the city Philadelphia because Philadelphia is the city of what? Yeah, see, you guys already know this stuff. 
Now, the chief Greek god worshipped in the town of Philadelphia was Dionysus. And we talked about him back when we talked about Smyrna. And if you have missed any of these, go back and you can get the podcast. Dionysus was the god of the frat party. Remember him? The god of wine and drinking and revelry and all these crazy, crazy parties and things like that. Um, and one of the reasons that, that Dionysus was the god of this city... Um, was because of the rich volcanic soil that was surrounded the area of Philadelphia. And and so they had all these incredible vineyards. They're still today very famous for the wine that they produce in this place because of this rich volcanic soil. But in order to have volcanic soil, you need what? Volcanoes, right? And if you have volcanoes, even if they're kind of dormant at the time, if you have volcanoes, you tend to have what? Yeah, earthquakes, right? You have earthquakes. And, and so in, in, so Philadelphia knew its share of earthquakes, okay? It, it might be considered the, you know, the, the Southern California uh, of the area. So in 17 AD, there was this incredibly violent earthquake that destroyed the whole city of Philadelphia. Just every, leveled everything. The Roman emperor at the time was Tiberius, and, and what he did for the city was he exempted the city for five years from paying taxes so that they could rebuild their city. He didn't send any supplies, he didn't send any manpower, or anything else, he just said, you know what, you guys can rebuild, but I, all, he, five years, no taxes. Well, they thought that that was pretty nice, and so what they did was they renamed the city to Neo Caesarea, Caesarea or New Caesar. Okay, so that, that they renamed it because they thought, okay, the Caesar's being kind of nice to us. But then in 23 AD, right after they had kind of finished the rebuilding process, they got hit by another er- terrible earthquake that leveled most of the city. Then in 54 AD, there was another earthquake, but the Caesar at that time was Nero, and Nero did absolutely nothing to help them, and so they changed their name back to Philadelphia, right? Then in 70 AD, there was another earthquake, and the Roman Empire at that time, Vespasian, did the same thing that Tiberius did, and he gave them a tax break. And so they renamed the city to Flavianus after Vespasian's wife. Okay? So you kind of get in the trend here. Then in 92 AD, the ruthless Roman Emperor Domitian, he passed a verdict. Okay? Um, Domitian not only was, was horrible in terms of persecuting Christians and things like that, he was just a ruthless guy. And, and um, one of the things that he did, that he passed this edict called the Vine Edict. Because what was happening is places like Philadelphia, they were starting to compete with Rome for their winemaking. And so um, Domitian was like, well, I don't want any competition. So what he did is he sent his soldiers out and he told them to rip out half of the vineyards in all of these places. And Philadelphia is one of them. So he says, just go rip out half the vineyards uh, so that they can't compete with us. And so it devastated their economy. And when that happened, they turned around and renamed the city back to Philadelphia, right? So... And so this was the city whose foundations was literally shaky, right? That shaky foundations and whose name and identity were always in question. These guys were, everything about it was just like not easy. Everything was shaken, right? And and they were a city that knew what it was like to get beat up by the political powers of the world. And and in the time where John penned these letters to Jesus, uh, these letters of Jesus to the church at Philadelphia, the Christians here were living in massive persecution. And so when this is happening, listen to how John addresses the city of Philadelphia. He goes on and says, write to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, and then he says, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, and what he opens, no man can shut, and what he shuts, no man can open. Now, we're going to talk just for a minute about what, what some of this means. The word holy in there means to be pure, unblemished, or untainted, okay? uh, to be completely pure. And, and, and so this city knew anything but that kind of ruler. And the word true is a unique word in the Greek that's used only a few times the, in, in this form, but it means not only to be, it means to be genuine or actually to be unshakable, 
unshakable. So think about that, if this word unshakable is to come and describe the city that's always being shaken, right? So Jesus is saying, hey, your city may get shaken up. The people around may not be true to their word and they might be not be true to taking care of you. But he's saying, I am the one who is true. And he goes on and he says, to him he, who holds the keys of David... And what he has opened, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no man can open. Now, this is actually a direct quote from um, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. And you can go home and look that up later. There's some really good history in there. And it's a reference to a guy named Eliakim. Eliakim was the palace administrator under King Hezekiah. And what had happened was, uh, back in the Old Testament times, is um, there was a guy named Sennacherib. He was the king of the Assyrians. And, and the, the nation of Israel had gotten split, and there was the northern kingdom, all the ten tribes other than Judah and Benjamin. And, and Assyria came in and just leveled the northern kingdom. But then they started to push in on Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom, and they, they came and they started to surround Jerusalem. And so Nacarib sends his envoy to the city of Jerusalem where King Hezekiah was hiding out. And, and, and this guy, the commander of the army, of the of Syrian army, comes up and, and he comes in front of the, the, the walls of Jerusalem and he yells out and he says, send out Eliakim and then these other leaders of the city. And so Eliakim comes to the walls and he's listening as this guy totally just taunts Israel and, and starts belittling Hezekiah and the God of Israel, right? And, and so Eliakim, he goes back to Hezekiah, the king of, of uh, Judah at the time, and he says, hey, um, man, the Assyrian army, they leveled the northern kingdom, they're here now, um, they're basically telling us uh, surrender or die, and they're making fun of our God, and they're making fun of you, king, and everything else, and Hezekiah goes back into the palace, and what happens is, is Hezekiah knows that if he goes to war, they're going to just get totally destroyed, and he goes back into the palace, and this guy gets on his knees, and he prays to God, and he says, God, you know our situation. God, you know what we are up against and you know that there's nothing that we can do without you. And so El Eliakim, they, they tell basically the commander of the Assyrian army, nothing. <laughs> and what happens is that night, that night we find out that God sends an angel of the Lord to the Assyrian camp and one angel of the Lord kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And Sennacherib puts his tail, tail between his legs and he goes home. They didn't have to fight at all. God fought the battle for them. And so this is a reminder that God will fight and he will deliver his people from their enemies if they will trust and depend on him. I mean, this is the message that the church in Philadelphia really needed to hear, but I think it's probably a message that most of us need to hear as well today. Because think about it, what, what enemies feel like they have gotten you surrounded today? I mean, what en enemies are, are touting you? What, what things in your life seem like, man, it, it, unless God shows up, I am just totally doomed in this situation. It, it could be a health situation. It could be a family situation. It could be a work situation. It could be a financial situation. I, I don't know what it is, but what situation is there in your life where you just feel like, man, if, 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 if I have to handle this myself, there's just no way this is turning out good. And I think the letter of this church reminds us that we have a God that not only knows what you're going through, he's saying, invite me in. Invite me in. And like Hezekiah, get on our knees and say, Lord, without your help, I'm, I'm a goner. And then depend on the Lord for his help. Will you persevere in the testing that comes in life? Will you invite the Lord in and allow him to fight the battles for you and to rescue you? Folks, our, our main job, our main job of everything else is to hold on to Jesus and let him do what he wants to do. It goes on in verse eight and it says this. Jesus says, I know your deeds. And every time we hear that, we kind of cringe a little bit. He says, I know your deeds. And he says, I, he says, see, 
I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. So he makes this repetitive statement. He's basically saying, hey, remember, I've showed up before when things seemed impossible and I'll show up for you as well. This statement also about an open door, uh, everywhere else in the New Testament that the phrase open door comes in, it's an opportunity to share the gospel. And you're thinking, these people in Philadelphia, man, it is hard to share the gospel in a, in a culture and in a society that wants nothing to do with it. To, when there's an emperor who wants you all dead, it's hard to share the gospel, right? And he's saying, hey, you just do what I'm calling you to do. Keep speaking the name of Jesus and keep sharing the gospel. You leave the rest of the fighting up to me. You do what I've called you to do, and I'll take care of the rest. And that's what this church needed to hear is, hey, you do what I'm calling you to do. You keep speaking the name of Jesus. You keep sharing the gospel because I have given you an open door for that. And I know it doesn't look like this is a really easy place to do that. He says, you do what you're called to do. You let me fight the battles is what God's telling them. Now, as we go through these next few passages, I I want you to notice something. I I want you, if if you're a person that writes in your Bibles or maybe right there in your notes in in your bulletin, Every time you see Jesus talk and use the, use the pronoun I, I, I want you to circle it, okay? I, I mean, like this one here, he says, I know your deeds. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Because through this next few verses, Jesus is going to say that over and over and over again. I know your deeds. I have placed the door before you that no one can shut. Okay, so he's the one that's doing this. Then he goes on and he says this, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. He says, I know, that's the second time he says, I know. I know, here's the thing, whatever's going on in your life, you're kind of hoping everybody else doesn't know. Jesus is looking at you and going, I know, I know. And it's not just the sin thing. He does know that, by the way. It's not just that part. He he knows your anxiety. He he knows that thing that's just like troubling you beneath the surface. He he knows that thing that that if if it gets just a little more out of control, it's going to be pretty hard in your life. He knows the devastation. He knows everything that's happening. He knows those voices that you hear when you lay your head down every night. He knows it all. He knows. And somehow we've got to get it through our thick skulls that somehow Jesus doesn't know all that stuff. Because he already knows it. And if he already knows it, why can't we just give it to him? He knows the demons that you're fighting. He knows the struggles that you're going through. And he knows the victories in your life. And he wants to celebrate those with you. But Jesus knows. He knows every single thing that's going on in your life. And in many cases, I believe he's just waiting for us to invite him in. He says, I know that you have little strength. These guys are nobodies in Philadelphia. It was the smallest of all the cities. I mean, the, the, the church there at the time was very small, and they were persecuted, okay? The, the, the Romans were just persecuting the heck out of these guys. And, and, and he says, look, I, I know that you've been persecuted. He says, but I know that you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Again, hold on to the word. Hold on to the name of Jesus, and then let God take care of the rest. It is not your strength that matters. It's your steadfast dependence on God to be your strength. And when you are desperate and dependent, that is the exact place that I think the Lord wants you to be, because that's where we have to reach out to him. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He wants you to come to him. If you're weary, if you are heavy, burdened, how many of you are in there today? He says, then come to me. He didn't say, hey, suck it up, get with the program. He says, come to me, I will give you rest. In 2 Corinthians 12, 19, it says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Where's God the most powerful? That very spot you can't handle. 
That's where he does his best work. Would you, will you let him work on it this morning? Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding, it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Okay? Folks, that's one you need to memorize. When you're getting anxious, you just need to quote that piece of scripture and remember that God is with you. See, there is nothing you are going through that Jesus can't get you through. And you should write that one down. There is nothing that you're going through that Jesus can't get you through. In verse nine, he goes on, he says, I, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but they are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Uh, the synagogue of Satan thing, okay, it sounds pretty, pretty crazy, and it was. We talked about this back when we talked about the church in Smyrna. These were Jewish people who claimed to be you know, the followers, the, the chosen ones of Israel. And remember we said that they had kind of brokered this deal with Rome. They didn't have to do some of the uh, Caesar worship stuff. And, and the Christians early on were seen as a sect of, of Judaism. So the Christians were kind of safe for a while until the Christians refused to stop speaking the name of Jesus. And then the Jews are like, all right, you guys are out. And the Jews actually started turning in the Christians to the Romans and saying, oh yeah, those Christian guys, they meet over there at that guy's house. And then the Romans would go in and grab them and persecute them, right? And so Jesus is saying, hey, I know what they're up to. I, I know that they, they think they're the chosen ones, but they're not. In fact, they're liars. They're, they're people who are going absolutely against the will of God. And, and this is huge because the people who thought that they were God's most holy people, who were thinking that they were blessed by God simply by, because of their nationality, will soon discover that they have been living in opposition to the plans and purposes of God. And there, there's no one, uh, there's, uh, I'm sorry, and the ones who thought that one day everyone would have to come to them in order to make it to salvation they're gonna find out that they're the ones who were rejected. God will prove the mockers and the bullies wrong and he'll take the self-righteous and he'll make them bow their knee. But what's interesting here is he says, I'm gonna make them bow down to you. I'm gonna make them bow down and help them and they're gonna realize, and what are they gonna realize? They're gonna realize that I have loved you. The Jews thought they were the ones that were, were loved by God that nobody could touch. But their history tells otherwise, doesn't it? And, and so God's saying, hey, those ones who've been turning you in, the ones who are causing you a lot of problems, one day those guys are gonna bow at your feet. See, this is the kind of stuff that God does. God, in that place in your life that you think you need vindication, don't do it yourself. God is way better at it than you are. Let him be the one that brings all that back around. See, there's a lesson in this for us that we need to let God be the one who fights our battles. It always will turn out better. He goes on, he says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth, world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon, he says, Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Have you been noticing how much of this is Jesus saying, I know, I know, I know, I will, I will, I will. Folks, who's this all about? It's about Jesus and what he will do. It's about Jesus and what he knows. And so much of the time, we think it's all about us. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. It's not about what, what you know or what you can do. It's about what he knows and what he can do. And so we need to turn that over to him. And then he says, look, I'm coming soon. Now there's this interesting uh, thing in this passage where he says, he talks about this trial that is going to come. Um, man, it, it, it's hard to know exactly what that is. I read a 
bunch of commentaries did a bunch of looking at the history. A lot of scholars believe that it's a reference to something that is actually coming soon in their history. Um, it was called the Barchoba Revolt in, uh, in 132 through 135 AD when Hadrian, uh, the, the emperor Hadrian, expelled all of the Jews from Rome and Jerusalem. He, he got rid of all of them. And when the Jews revolted because of it, 580,000 Jews were killed okay, by the, by the Roman Empire. And what we see here is the tables get flipped because remember what happened? Because the Jews, okay, they were telling the Romans, those Christians aren't part of us. Those Christians aren't part of us, right? So when this persecution happens to the Jews, right, Think about this. The very thing that got the Christians persecuted all of a sudden starts saving all of them. Because when the Romans start persecuting the Jews, the Christians are like, oh yeah, remember, we're not part of them. That very thing that you might be thinking is the toughest thing in the world right now that you're going through, it might just be God's setup to save you. And folks, you don't know the end of the story, do you? but we worship somebody who does. And the question is, don't you want him in control? The crazy part is, is he's not gonna share the control with you. You've gotta let him take the wheel. Let him be in control. Jesus moves on in, in, in verse, uh, in verse uh, 12 and he says, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write them, write them uh, uh, my new name. Whoever has ears to, ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, naming in the city is huge. He says, hey, look, I'm gonna make them a pillar in the city, right? Remember what happened to all the other pillars that they kept erecting? They kept falling down. Right? And Jesus says, no, I, I'm gonna erect some pillars and it's gonna be my people, not just the, not just the stone and things like that. I, my church is gonna be built differently. It's gonna be built on the lives of the people and that will be unshakable. See, naming of the city in Philadelphia was a little bit wonky, wasn't it? They kept changing the name. Every time they thought somebody was gonna do something good for them, they'd change their name to reflect that and then they'd change it back to their name and then back to the Caesar's name and all over the place. These were people who struggled with identity and Jesus, to a city that struggles with that identity, says, I'm gonna write my name on you. If you're faithful, I will write my name on you and that city is never gonna crumble again. That temple will never fall. One of the things that we got to see when we were in Philadelphia, uh, the only thing left, in the city of Philadelphia are, are a few pillars, and they were to one of the, the temples to Zeus. And if, if you go in there, uh, you actually can see inscriptions of people's names, all the benefactors, right, who helped rebuild, because remember, Rome didn't send any money, so the people who gave money to rebuild the temples, they put their names kind of like what we would do on bricks and things like that. They put all their names up there, right? They put their names on there only to have most of the pillars just fall again. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to rebuild this temple. He says, I'm going to rebuild this thing, and I'm going to write my name on there, and it's going to be something that does not fall. And he wants to write his name upon us and upon our hearts, because it is something that will not fall. What's amazing about the church in Philadelphia is this, is that of all of the churches, out of all of the seven churches, it might have been the smallest but it's the one that persevered the longest. Through all of history, all the others fell. But the church in Philadelphia lasted, um, most historians tell us, until 1379. All the way from, the, from the, the, you know, the time just after Jesus, all the way to 1379. And what's crazy is there was war all around it. There was persecution all around it. I mean, you know, different groups of people would come in and destroy the place and different wave after wave of Roman Empire would order persecution and all these things were happening and the city was just leveled and leveled and wars and fighting and all these things. But the church that persevered the longest was Philadelphia. And here's an example of a church that in the face of great persecution and opposition and hardship, 
held on to God's word, held on to the name of Jesus, and endured. A church that held on to the truth of God's word without compromise, who upheld Jesus' name even when it would cost them their lives. And folks, this is a message that we all need to hear. Because we, we live in a day and age when, when being a follower of Jesus it, it is becoming increasingly difficult. We live here, most, most even Bible scholars will tell us, most Christian thinkers are telling us, man, we are living in, at, at the, in the beginnings of a post-Christian culture here in America. We live in a time in our history and in our nation where Christianity and biblical principles are seen as a threat to individual freedoms and, and national progress. And these are things that will cause us, if we hold on to the truth, if we uphold the Bible as truth, if we uphold the name of Jesus, that folks, we're in for a rocky ride. That that, that we will experience persecution because of that. And I can only imagine the kinds of persecution that our children and our grandchildren might face if they really stand up for the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, but persevere. We must persevere and we must teach our kids and our grandkids to persevere, to hold on to the name of Jesus no matter what the world throws at us. Because remember, there is nothing that you are going through that Jesus can't get you through. One of my favorite pieces of scripture in the Bible is in Hebrews chapter 12. It starts in verse one and says this, therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with what? Perseverance. I mean, let's run and keep at it. Let's run with perseverance. In other words, what Jesus is telling you about the race that you have to run is this, is you don't win unless you persevere. It doesn't mean you just like come to Jesus and then all of a sudden you have to stop working at it. It doesn't say that you, you give your life to Jesus and then you don't have to, work, you know, you just don't have to deal with it anymore, that you won't be persecuted. He says, no, you come to Jesus, he says, and you gotta persevere. You gotta hold on to this. He says, perseverance, it, let's run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, okay? We know what that's about around here, right? There's not a Saturday around that you don't see like spray paint on the, on the streets and stuff where people are marking out a race, right? And who gets to win? The ones that push through, the ones that persevere. And he says, fixing our eyes on who? He's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Because for the joy set, but now guys, this, this passage of scripture is so rich. For the joy set before him, he what? Endured, and what did he endure? Jesus endured the cross. If there's anybody who knows what perseverance looks like, it's Jesus. If there's anybody who understands what it means to take it, to uphold the faith, It is Jesus. If there's anybody who knows that you may have to pay the ultimate price for following the will of God, it is Jesus. If there's anybody who knows what it's like to get mocked or beaten or spit on or ridiculed or bullied or anything else, it's Jesus. And he endured. He pressed on. And he endured the cross. And it says he scorned its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, folks, whatever you are going through today, whatever it is that you're feeling like you have to endure, Jesus endured the cross so that you could endure the difficulties of this life, knowing that there's a promise of eternal life, that no matter what happens in this life, there's an eternal life to come. And the question is, Are you trusting him for it? Are you trying to just take on the craziness of life by your own strength, your own power? Or are you trusting the one who has already endured the cross for your sake? Have you allowed the blood of Jesus to cleanse you? Have you allowed Jesus' sacrifice to make you whole? 
Are you trusting and holding on to his name? So how do we get his name on us? Well, it's by trusting him, by giving our lives and our hearts to Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you have never done that, then man, we, we want to give you the opportunity to do that today. I'm going to ask that during our time of communion that, that some of our, our elders and their spouses, if they're here with them, would just come down here to the front. Uh, and and if, you need, if you need prayer this morning because you are struggling through a difficulty, if you need people to come alongside of you so that you can persevere, people who will walk with you through the difficulties and the struggles, then, then I want to invite you to come to, to pray with us this morning. If you need a church home that you can plant in and you want to you connect with the church family here, then come and we want to talk to you about uh, how, how, how you do that, how you get connected here. If you need Jesus to be Lord in your life so that you can stop depending on your strength and let him fight the battle for you, then come. Come and talk to us because we don't want you walking out of here thinking that you've got to do this all on your own. Because there is nothing this life will throw at you that Jesus can't get you through. So hold on to him this morning. So we take communion to remember that Jesus did endure the cross. And that piece of bread represents his broken body. That cup represents Jesus' shed blood. And he endured that so that you could have the promise of eternal life. So if you need prayer this morning, if you need to connect, please make a move. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We thank you that, Father, you, you endured on our behalf. That, Father, you, you understand what it's like. You even understand what it's like to be far from the Father. But, Father, you understand. Lord, Lord Jesus, you understand that the Father will fight our battles for us. And Father, we, we pray that, Lord God, we would learn to give the control and the anxieties and the fears and the shame and the doubt all over to you and let you do in us what only you can do. We love you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name.